We've got flags and banners, and if you mind your manners, we might even get to standards and what they represent. So just take my boy's hand, and we'll both try to understand how this vexillion logic podcast could be flagged for content. Flagged for content. What's up, Vexheads, and welcome to episode 33 of Flagged for Content. It's the only podcast left in my life that I'm going to have to record on this preamp because I can see what's in the mail, and my fiancé might have gotten me a cool birthday present. So, coming up, this show might sound a little better, at least my end. Everyone else sounds great. Anyway... It's also a Flags for Good podcast, which I mention every week, as I should, because, one, they support this show in ways that I could not have fathomed when I started, and two, they're just a great flag company. If you have any needs that involve flags, you could call them flag needs, I guess, you should head to flagsforgood.com. You can also use my code, flagged for the number four, like the digit, content, on anything that you get there and that will get you 10% off and I'm not gonna lie it kicks a little bit back to the show as well so that's nice and it lets them know that hey you're aware of us you're aware of them and you're just a good person so you know if I were a good person that's what I'd do anyway um we also do a Instagram game called Fresh Flags that is currently being won this season is currently being won by at Drapo SFV. They may not have been the fastest to chime in on the last one, but they were the fastest on one of the last few. Um, but also, just wanted to give them the shout out because they are currently the pack leader. I think they have gotten all seven correct as of this recording. So go check out our Instagram at Flagged for Content, <clears throat> the number four. And Check out Fresh Flags, which they are crushing it at. I don't have a whole lot to get into at the top of this one. I'd rather just go ahead and get into the episode. The one thing I will say is if you are a viewer, you will notice that uh, you can't see me and Zach talking this time. That is because Zach had some issues with his video, so we decided to just kind of put something else over the video part and just kind of record it like audio. Um, Yeah, that said, enjoy myself and friend of the show kick acidron from a couple early episodes and other friend of the show dart crimsonfeld who you can find in our discord i will at both of them uh but they helped me they you know yeah we played human fall flat it was a blast if you don't know human fall flat you should play that game it's totally separate not a sponsor Anyway, I'm running long as I usually do. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into the episode. I had a great time talking to Zach. If you have any like questions at all about like how flags of the world or CRW flags or like the wiki side of flag things works, pretty much a guarantee that Zach answered it during this episode. Um, If he didn't, then good news. He'll be back on at some point, especially once we figure out his video Um, and you can ask him then or ask the show then rather. I think that's pretty much it. Um, next week, I, I actually don't know who's up next week. I've got a few things kind of up in the air, some that are recorded, but we'll see which one I decide to slot in next week on the first. Anyway, all that said, let's go ahead and get into the episode. Enjoy this one with Zachary Harden of Flags of the World. Folks, we've got another one this week. You know him from his work on Wikipedia. You may know him from having saved your sixth grade homework assignment, allegedly. And you know him as the vice director of Flags of the World. It's Zachary Harding! Hello, everybody. (laughs) What's up, Zach? Uh, Nothing much, man. How about yourself? I'm doing well. It's a beautiful day here in Tennessee. How's, uh, How's Arkansas treating you? It's about the same. It's like... Argentina blue outside, just nice Celeste weather. Ooh, I do like that. You had some like time to enjoy it this weekend too, from what I understand. Uh, yes, sir. So I was in Kansas City for the past in the past weekend to kind of just get away from here. Um, mm. So some of the things I did, I got to experience some of the NFL draft. Um, I was also be able to see in person the new 
city flag that they adopted about two months ago. Yeah, which was that's the part we want to hear about. <laughs> which was absolutely beautiful. It definitely stands out. Um, a lot cleaner design, um, and mm. also got to take in a little bit of the MLS as well. Oh hell yeah, yeah! All in all, pretty good weekend. It sounds like. Mm-hmm. I would love to see. I've yet to see the uh, Kansas City flag flying or not in the wild at all. So yeah, the video you posted in the Discord, which listeners and viewers should join. Just saying, was uh was. I think the first time I've seen it waving. That was cool. All right. Well, back heads, we have a lot to get into today, so no more small talk here. Um, we have no shortage of great stuff on the flagpole. First, we have our usual over, maybe underrated. We'll figure it out. Um, we will get into Zachary's work with Wikipedia and Flags of the World, of course. He's going to educate us on some Thai royal support flags. If you don't know what that means, I don't either. You're in good company. And we are going to discuss why the Arkansas flag is just as valid with Comic Sans. Hmm. But before we get to any of that, Zach, I like to ask my guests, what is the flag that got you into flags? The uh, state of Hawaii. Uh, when I was uh, a, a young kid, gotcha. I lived in Hawaii because my dad was in the military. And we did a lot of things related to the flag in school so we had a lot of history lessons about the flag we get to see it a lot um and we also did like color guards and things like that and and once i leave the school and go back to the military base there's all the protocols associated with it so you get to see the daily loitering the um Mm -hmm all the travesties and all the rituals regarding the military use the folding just and with it being such an international community as well because we also had a lot of japanese that live in hawaii filipino you get to see cultures and flags from all over the world and it's just fascinating to learn about them yeah for sure i it also strikes me now that we're talking about it that i bet like especially on bases like that where they're, they're flying obviously the american flag and the state flag does the hawaiian flag look extra cool next to the american flag does it kind of like enhance it at all because they're similar ish in design uh yes it does because not only you just have the same color so but the designs are so abstract to where you have the the red and white stripes of the u.s flag you have red white and blue for hawaii and also the different color stripes is there so it's so different yet these are so look nice together yeah i imagine that those are two that would look really nice together it's another one i don't think i've ever seen in the wild my fiance we're, we're gonna go to hawaii at some point but it has not happened for me yet she's been a few times but um yeah the hawaiian flag has like a, an interesting history too because like a lot of people are like why does it have the uh you know the the union flag the union jack in quotes on there and i think it wasn't until recently that i learned that that actually goes back like further than i thought or something do you know the history of it um i don't know the exact history offhand but i know that in like the mid to late 1800s like before the united states annexed hawaii um, as a territory like there's been different stripe designs used by the royal houses Mm -hmm. um, of hawaii and those stripes you can see even to this day like no matter if it's an actual state flag itself or for those that are advocating for separation of hawaii from the United States to where instead of having a red, white, and blue uh, stripe, it's going to be like a yellow, green, and red stripes that you'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've seen that one. I think flags for good sells that one or similar. It's whatever the, uh, it starts with a K. I can't remember the, the name of it, mm-hmm. but I'm sure a lot of stuff in Hawaiian starts with a K. So it doesn't narrow it down too much, but yeah, yeah. I, I didn't learn until very recently that it, yeah, it was what you said. It's like, they just, they had a lot more, they had closer trading ties, I think, with the British via, you know, British holdings in the in the Pacific than they did most other places. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that is a cool one. That's definitely one that uh, it's up there on my list, but it's not one that I like think of as a state flag. I don't know why. I think of Alaska, you know, the f- lower 48. And then I think of Alaska. I don't know why I don't always think of Hawaii, but anyway. Let's uh so we had a little talk like off air before before we started recording and as far as the over and underrated flags you had you had like a an interesting case I guess to make um yes. yeah uh, so 
coming up with an overrated flag was kind of pretty difficult because I know there's been a lot of redesigns and I'm thinking, I'm not sure. I think this might be better. I just don't know how this works. But for underrated, um, there is an Estonia town by the name of Kanape. In 2018, because of an online poll, they adopted like city symbols. So they adopted a coat of arms, a flag, and a seal. And in this flag um there's a giant green pot leaf in the middle of a white <laughs> field almost like a canadian pale kind of style to where you have like green bars on the side yeah, yeah and then you have a white field and then you have a green pot leaf just straight in the middle and and people were thinking why does this town want to adopt a flag like this and the name of the town itself derives from the estonian word of cannabis yeah, I can see that. I'm reading about it now on uh on the the link that you sent, and I guess like it, the name of the town deriving from that is not an accident because it says residents traditionally grew marijuana and hemp to turn into goods such as cloth, oil, and rope. So it sounds like it was like this town's staple crop for X number of years, you know, for a while though. Yes, and so guess- and just and just and even though that we are constantly seeing a lot of flags with like weird symbolism, especially from like some areas of the Russian Federation that has sure. like yeah. a, a bear and inside of a, a atomic uh, atomic symbols, but just seeing just a giant pot leaf on a center flag in their iron in their unironically, unlike some of the flags we have seen from Canada in the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just be there intentionally. It's just like very unusual. Yeah, that is pretty pretty wild. But yeah, because at first, like I think you could be excused for thinking it's like a Bodie McBoat based situation, like. I don't know a few people just thought something was funny, but then you read it and it's like, oh yeah, no, that was, that was the crop that that's kind of like why the town's on the map. So it makes sense. I don't, did they already have, I'm trying to read it and talk at the same time. Did they already have that seal or that, uh, that coat of arms or was that kind of voted on at the same time as this? they generally, uh, so a lot of the Eastern European countries that have like heraldry commissions, they'll adopt all three symbols at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. Gotcha. Cause, um, uh, there's a neighboring country of theirs, Lithuania, has a heraldry commission that is on Facebook, and they kind of talk about the process of what they do in cor- uh, to create symbols for not only government institutions, but for just city and local governments. And uh, they kind of explain how it works and, and also show that they'll adopt all three symbols, at least in Lithuania, at the same time. So the flag, a standard, a seal, and also a coat of arms. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. If you don't have any, you need three. Why not, you know, two birds, one stone, three birds, one stone, I guess, in this case. Awesome. Yeah. So that is, uh, that was, you know, underrated. It's not, not really rated. I had never heard of it, but I'm glad you brought it to my attention. That will definitely be in the show notes and uh, on the screen here for the viewers. But let's go ahead and get into your your work with both Wikipedia and Flags of the World. And Obviously, it's going to be a surprise to nobody that this is going to be the bulk of the episode because this is what uh, our listeners and viewers have been like dying to hear about a little kind of behind the scenes. How does it work, especially in the case of Flags of the World? Um, I mean, we can start wherever, but I usually like to start at the beginning. Like what what kind of got you into were you a Wikipedian first or were you doing Flags of the World stuff first or kind of concurrent or? Uh, Flags of the World first. I was first introduced to the website in 1988, 1999, because um, I mm. was watching some videos um, about the former Soviet Union, because we ha- at my middle school, we had a lot of studies about the former Soviet Union. And some of the videos I watched were of different, like even parades or ceremonies that were occurring on Red Square. So I was right. documenting everything. And my first contact with the website was Rob Rayside, who is still the director to this day, and then once I and once I started kind of emailing, doing doing images on like Microsoft Paint, um, it's just kind of that's pretty much my involvement for a while, just either doing drawings, uh, reporting mm-hmm. on things, and it's just networking with some of the people in Flags of the World. So the people still with us, like um, Zelkoheimer, the current sure. leadership of FIAV, our umbrella organization, uh, Nozomi Karyasu from Japan, uh, but also some people who have uh, passed away over the time, such as 
Dove Gutterman uh, from Israel, uh, Dev Cannon from Tennessee, and hey. just so many different people. And this is more just networking. Then once yeah. I finished uh, middle school and high school, start going to college, um, that's when I start becoming more into vector graphics. Um, yeah. So wait. So just to pause there for a second, it's like so all this that you just said, you're doing all that in like seventh, eighth grade and then through high school. Yes, because it was just a way for me to kind of just um, expand my knowledge, but sure, also be yeah. able to go and just help people out. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I, with me learning all the stuff about the Soviet Union, it's like I was introduced to things into some of the post-Soviet countries. I was learning a little bit of Cyrillic, so I was able to go and just mm -hmm. read a bunch of stuff, get some books, and kind of just help out. Gotcha. So that was – okay, cool, cool. Did you do any like uh, – you know, high school, like projects or middle school projects on flags, anything like that? Um, yes and no. So we didn't necessarily <laughs> have to do actually projects on flags, but hmm. I was able to use my knowledge to go enhance like projects. So I was able to use pictures or to help classmates to say, hey, this is what you need to use. This is what I would suggest, things like that. Yeah, right on. That's awesome. All right. So we're, we're through that. We're in college now and you're learning vector graphics. I imagine that helps a ton. It's that helps a ton. I wish I knew more vector graphics stuff. But. So how I got into so how I got into vector graphics is that around the time I was joining Wikipedia in two thousand four, two thousand five, uh, so just getting into college, um, that's when they started doing a changeover from from PNG graphics for national flags to SVG because they're able to get all the code and figure out how to be able to do it without showing anything malicious to mm -hmm. end users. So I started just doing just basic stuff. So I was doing like flags of European countries, uh, South American countries, kind of like things that are simple tri bars just to go in, just learn vector graphics. Yeah, smart way to do it. Just kind of do the conversions. And then just later on, I would say about two years after that, that's when I became an administrator for the not only the main English Wikipedia, but also for the Commons, which is the up the image uploading website. Right. Yeah. And and I was doing a little bit of F L T W editing at that time, but I would say roughly around 2010 to 2012, I had to pretty push put a pause on everything because I finished college, because um, I was also moving a lot too. Went from North Carolina to California, right, spent yeah. some time in Japan, and eventually settling in Arkansas in 2009. And once I got settled in Arkansas, I was trying to go make a living, finish college, and just things got a little bit too tough. So I just mm. took a step back from a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, I got back into editing again around about 2015, 2016. So I, so I finally got the career sorted out, got my personal life sorted out, and, and it started with just Japan because of my knowledge of the language. Right. And then eventually went to Thailand for editing. And then it's kind of just grew and grew and grew. I just became vice editor, I think, one or two years ago. So now I am Congrats. directly awesome. <laughs> underneath Rob website when it comes to not only website operations, but just a lot of different things. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely put in the time. You've been doing it since middle school. So, and uh, yeah, to get the recognition is is probably nice, and and to to be able to do the work that that uh. I mean, a lot of listeners and myself would be, would die to do really. So, um, yeah. So you mentioned, uh, Japan and, and going over there and knowing a little bit of Japanese, I assume that ties into like what area of flags of the world you do a lot of the stuff in like, in like Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, right? Yes. Okay. So that's how you kind of like got that is because. You were the one that spoke Japanese. <laughs> well, and also because it's like I was able to kind of bridge the gap between like Japanese users and the English uh, users and kind of just, uh, go in between. So let's go ahead and take an example right now. Um, so I'm in the process on working on getting pages created or updated for university flags that are for schools that are based in Japan. So how mm. that works is um is we're, we all have a mailing list it's on groups.io and and people join that mailing list and they submit information on 
what they found. Like they can be pictures they took themselves, could be legislation they found, it could mm-hmm. be information found on Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Just as long as there's a credible source that we can look at, confirm, okay, we know what this is, then that information is stored in like an email list and then I get what's called a digest every month. So every editor and their realm will get a digest of everything that falls to them. So in my yeah. case, I'll get anything from Japan, nearly all Southeast Asia, um, Belarus, the Baltics, and then a couple of nations here and there. And in this email, I'll see not only who sent it, when it was sent, what images were attached or any, and all the text they sent, no matter what language it was. So I take that information if I have to create a new page, I use um, a HTML editor to go and create a new page. Uh, we have templates for creating pages, so it's not necessarily difficult. But a lot of times I just take a page I already made, make a new page from it, and just change a few yeah. things. Yeah, um, I know how that goes. That's how I do like the, the guest intros for this. I'm like, all right, erase what you know the last person from. <laughs> you know this person from this. <laughs> the principle is the same anyway mm-hmm. yeah no that's um that's awesome so we were talking uh a little bit up top and and i had you not fill me in on any of these because i want to be just as like surprised or dumbstruck or whatever but wanted to hear about some of the like weirder like wackier wilder i don't know whatever word you want to use it starts with w <laughs> apparently like things you've had to edit or change or add on wikipedia or on flags of the world i imagine there's probably more on wiki but I would say definitely more on Wikipedia. Like there's some things that have been sent to me recently within like the past like, couple of years that I'll see for FOTW and I'm giving a lot of liberty with regards to what I need to go add and things like that. So if there's information that is sent to me and there's no sources, I usually will take the time and try to flesh out a source. So like with the university pages I'm working on, I was given everything except for like a link or two to show that the flags are in use. That's mm-hmm. no problem. I can just go take the the name of the university, type into Google, I find an image or find a source of it being used. Okay, cool. And then I can go add it in. With Wikipedia, it's a lot harder because yeah. there's you're dealing with a lot of people. There's some people that focus on this field all the time on mm-hmm. Wikipedia and sometimes trying to tell them, hey, this is a source I received. And some people are like, that's not good enough. Like, um, the, I know the one American issue I've been having article. lately is uh, in the past with Mar- Mauritania, whenever they changed their flag back in 2018. I can yep. show them scans and documentations we got from embassies. And they looked at me like, man, that's not good enough. It's like, um, <laughs> sure, you got it from the embassy, but that looks like original research. And then two years later, mm-hmm. all of our research was validated because they put everything on like a a branding website. And once we were able to show it to them, we're like, oh, I'm sorry. We could have done this two years ago, but yeah, no, we had to sit um, on our hands because an embassy letter wasn't good enough. Right. One issue I was able to solve from just deductive reasoning and just using research and knowledge of foreign languages was a couple of years ago. They were having a lot of issues with determining what color shades should you be using for the national flag of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And so what we have to go do is, okay, what does legislation say? So we either look at the national constitution where some of these flags are listed in, or sometimes they'll have a law about the national symbols themselves. Inside that law about the national symbols, it says this state office is going to determine the shade of colors and construction methods used for the national flag. We go, okay. Then we go to that institute. We type in a few keywords. We find out, okay, this is where this document is. Now we need to go ahead and find it. Sometimes they'll email it to us saying, hey, it's for academic purposes. You're free to use it. Some some people might spend like $2 for it. Um, mm-hmm. I know we're having an issue like this with the Saudi flag on Wikipedia. And getting that information is almost like spending 50 US. With which flag? Saudi Arabia. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. Because uh, a lot of these technical standard agencies uh, that do things such as um, building materials, foodstuffs, clothing, textiles, they also will have specifications on the national flags themselves that they'll use mm. for commercial purposes or state purposes. So we somehow got this document from Ukraine, 
And we, so they made the scan, put it on Wikipedia, and because it was a government document, we were able to host it on Wikipedia because it was public domain. Mm -hmm. And once we saw, okay, this is the color shades they need, we'll go to the Pantone website, we'll get the hex code from them, um, either by them listing it in the past or now, we just got to just screenshot and just copy the color. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go put it in the SVG code, upload it. Everyone's good. Cool. Easy That's peasy. probably the biggest fight that we probably still have to this day. Because <laughs> um, yeah. I know we have that same issue with Italy in the past. Um, the where should we use the actual Pantone color? Should we actually use the HTML codes? Um, like the web safe colors. And that's just been something that's been going on for years. Yeah. So Yeah, I, I didn't know any of those fights. The one that I am familiar with uh, that Tara has brought up and that she is a, a warrior in this battle, I guess is like just the American flag article on Wikipedia. It has, uh, I'm sure you probably know about this, but like the color that it has in the, whatever they call the example image, like that's up at the top, right. Usually is like, a, it's off. It's like a little bit too purple. It um, looks like a flag that's been out in, you know, in the sun for like a few months or something, but so... there's no changing it. So that is some insight I can give. Uh, so the main issue is under uh, – so there's a military specification called um, – I'm trying to, trying to remember, but I know it's like – it ends in 416F. So it's a military specification for the national flag um, and also for the uni – for the – the, the national jack so the mm -hmm. 50 star canton yeah. and the problem is all editions um from like big issue a to issue e all use what's called cable colors and these are the same color shades that are used in the national flag of the philippines but in edition f which was in like the early 1990s Mm -hmm. They still list that the cable colors from the colors hosting the United States should be used for the national flag, but they do not give the exact shades at all. And mm. the only time you can actually get shades is if, let's say, you go to other documents for, let's say, graveside flags or oh yeah, that makes stuff sense. like that. And these are publications you can you can find easily because they're public domain. Um. But it's just with them, like, given the lack of specifications, and they're using a lot of yeah. scholarly articles about spectrum colors and not using Pantones. Like, until really those specifications change to Pantone colors, those colors are going to pretty much be the way that they are because mm. there's no online source saying you have to use these Pantone shades. Sure, yeah. we can do uh, the graphic design manual from the US State Department, some other places. But until that military specification says you will use Pantone colors, they're not going to change it. Okay, so that's the the one that overrides really anything else. Gotcha. Yes. So, um, actually, let me F one six F. So hang on. So I will remember that. Yeah. So D D D dash F dash four one six F. That's the specification. Gotcha. Yeah. Did not know that. I don't know if Tara knew. Tara might have known that, but I. I tried to change it a couple times and then I was just like getting petty and I was like, I'm just going to get kicked off Wikipedia if I keep doing this. So like, that's the extent of things. I usually just change like grammar or something here and there, but I don't know. Like the world that you live in on Wikipedia edits is way different than anything I've ever seen. So it is very cool. What like generally when I talk to guests about flags that are kind of that are like that, like what we just talked about and, and the Ukraine colors, it's because something has been like, left too open-ended in e even in like official paperwork it will just not say something um there was one of those a big one recently that i talked to a guest about that i obviously can't think of now i think it was maybe with uh france uh, i think it was i think it was with nasha yeah maybe it yeah it was france thank you because you know macron is prefers the darker shade so he's kind of like He's, he's made sure that those are the ones that are seen on TV and with him and everything. But previously, it used to be like a slightly lighter one. And then, yeah, as Nasha said, he's like, it's not specified. So as long as it's red and blue, you know, it's good. What, what do you like? I guess in cases like that, what do you do on Wikipedia? Do you just uh, I notice like uh, the France one right right now, I'll say. It has the darker shade as the like uh, whatever you call the image at the top. And then under that slightly smaller, it has the 
former, you know, the former colors, I guess you could call it. So this is something where FOTW and Wikipedia will diverge mm. from each other. So, for example, I'll, I'll go with Thailand. Back mm. in, I would say, 2017, 2018, I don't know the exact year, so I apologize. But around that time, there was um, colors that were specified by a prime minister order. So on Wikipedia, they'll make they'll take the old color shade and turn that into a former flag, while they'll mm-hmm. use a new color shade as a new current standard, things like that. So right, they'll create yeah. like historical information about this. While on flags of the world, we see it as a continuation. If there's no design change overall, it's like mm. then we will consider the flag to be the same. So, okay. uh, so for example, like when we went from the forty-nine star to fifty star um, in nineteen sixty, then yes, we would consider that a significant design change. So we say this flag was adopted on July fourth, nineteen sixty, for the United States. While yeah. for Thailand, we still consider the design adopted in September of nineteen seventeen, and we just see the the color change a few years ago as just a slight modification instead of a completely brand new design um same thing with japan it's like even though yes technically Mm -hmm. the national flag was adopted in 1999 and they changed some specifications to it but we still generally will say at least on fotw that this design's been in place since like the 1870s or something like that when it was used by the um by the meiji government while on wikipedia they will say 1999 august 1999 gotcha so uh as a well as you specifically somebody who does both you just kind of have to keep that in the back of your head and just be like all right it's wiki we're doing it this way (laughs) or it's flags of the world we're doing it you know the right way i would say but yeah so uh, with fotw it's pretty much me myself and i and then with some people with some oversight saying hey we need to do this we need to do that but a lot of times it's like Hey, here's some suggestions I have for you. It's like, hey, here's something you can add, like linking wise. Right. But a lot of times, I'm usually just kind of left alone. While Wikipedia, it's like, if I make a change, my inbox is full, or my talk page is full. I'm just like, yeah, really, yeah. So, so you, uh, like the, the way that you just said that it works at Flags of the World, is that something that you have influence over the way that it works? Like, is it a kind of a rule that you set for yourself and follow or was it already in place so so i'm just curious really so ad hoc is like generally um if there's someone else editing a page i generally kind of leave it alone unless there's information mm. i want to go and add to it and generally how i do that is i'll do a message to the mailing list so at least it's captured and at least it's public so someone yeah. else can take a look at it or if it's just like a simple html fix or some kind of coding issue i'll go to the editor directly privately say hey um i noticed this is missing or this link is broken gotcha cool i have a a question that i have I think I've had since I heard of flags of the world. Sure. And this is because like, once I started the show and I was, you know, uh, trying to get, you know, Wikipedia is fine for like, you can get big images of flags, like normal flags. But if you're really searching, like really trying to dig deep, find some rare flag, whatever flags of the world is like where you go. Like even it's where Google takes you. If you just Google flag of uh high Netherlands or something. And uh, I would, I was always getting, I would always get directed to, um, what is it? CRW flags? Yes. But is that the same thing as Flags of the World or is that different? Because when I was sourcing things, yes, I was it like, it's I the think same it's thing. from CRW, but this says, okay, it is the same thing. Yes. Yeah, so what it is, it's 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 a mirror system. Uh, so FOTW was started as a mirror system because of how the internet was working at the time of founding to where, so they had a mirror based in Germany, a mirror based in the United States, which is CRW. Uh, mm-hmm. They had a mirror based in the UK. Uh, Switzerland and so many other places okay, okay. that if let's say something was going wrong in the United States, you can still access the information. And there are some mirrors that are update weekly, like CRW is the main mirror. Um, and it's based off of a flag manufacturer and a flag seller in uh, Maryland. That was the other thing that I thought, because I saw CRW flags and then it says something about like purchasing or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and sponsors are allowed to go put like a link to their website, 
but uh-huh. we can't directly sell on the website itself. And then, and it was the internet kind of got the way it was. Some of the mirrors closed because they were just costs or just the people just unfortunately passed away or just web services were going down. So a lot of flag companies would go and take up the mirror portion of it. So right, a couple right. years ago, CRW was made the official mirror because not only it updated quicker, but it's just uh, that's who we use for our um, F- F- FTP uploading. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it'll make more sense to people that are a little more techie than me, but I get the general uh, gist of it anyway. I do remember mirrors and, and all that. I don't think you see it as much anymore, but... All right. Yeah, no, I did want to ask about that because like first when I stumbled upon uh, CRW flags when I was doing my research and it said something about purchasing flags, I was like, wait, can I buy like the, sh- the shit that I can find on here? No, not not some of the, the really rare ones. Sometimes, yes, because I know the, you can go on the website and find like an Okinawa prefecture desk flag or some other just random stuff here and there. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. OK, so um, I, I did want to get into you were talking about Thailand uh these thai the, i mentioned them up top these thai what are they called like royal like royal flags, flags as a, as a support flags royal support flags i guess i didn't mention them up top but i meant to yeah what 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 are thai what are royal support flags okay. are, are these unique to thailand or like what uh i've never uh, heard yes of these are unique to thailand and they're made for every single monarch uh so how the overall design works is that there is the background color is based on the day, the physical day they were born. So that includes the the day of the week and the year. And it's based on their lucky color. So a color that gives them the most luck. So in the case of the current monarch, uh, King Rama X, um, he was born on a Monday. So because of that, um, the color background of his flag is like a golden yellow, the same as his father. Um, oh King yeah, Robert I'm looking at it now. Okay, is um, the background color is yellow, and then the cipher that's in the center was done by the. Um, there is a government agency, uh, the Department of Fine Arts. They will go and draw a cipher for the monarch, and they'll use this cipher, put in the center on the flag, and these can be used by the general population. So you see these at businesses, homes. Um, oh, whenever the okay. specific members are in town, they can display them, birthdays, you name it. They can be displayed year round without any kind of consequence. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I guess like if I was the king, I, I wouldn't be mad at people for like sporting, like flying my uh, my personal flag or whatever. Be like, yeah, that's me. I did that. Cool. Those are my colors. Yeah, these are separate from the military standards that they'll use during official visits. So mm-hmm. they can't use like the square flag with the Garuda in the middle. Uh, which is like the monarch's flag, but if they just use the flag with his personal cipher on there, there's no penalty. Right, right. Yeah, these are very cool. I'm I'm looking at the list of them now. I wonder, like, <laughs> I wonder, like, what day, like, my birthday, like, I wonder what the background color for that would be and all that stuff. I know for mine, is there a way um, to look it up? I kind of looked this up. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I was born on Thursday in May, and I guess mine's like a like a purplish color so it's going to be the same color as the crown princess uh serene horn um, right there is a website you can look it up i just don't know it offhand i was born on a monday in may so i don't see any of those well i'm not going to go digging through it right now anyway but yeah so these these are very cool so like um closest thing that i've seen like in the western you know world or whatever whatever you want to call it is like especially it's in the popular conscious now with the coronation going on They've got, you know, like the the monarchs have their flags with like the, in his case, is a CR and then whatever the, the Roman numeral. But you're saying that that would be more similar to like the royal flag than Correct. to these. Is that right? Okay. Yes, because these because these ones that are people use for support, um, there are some designs that are specific for just that monarch for just enter ger- general day use, but... Uh, there's also some examples where if there's a certain milestone coming up, like either like a coronation, a a birth anniversary, or a anniversary on the throne, um, they will create special flags for that. And I just received one for the Queen Mother's um, birthday. Um, 
where they did a special design symbol on like a light blue background. Awesome. Are these on Flags of the World too? I've been trying to put these on because I am the Thailand editor. Um, so not only I'll try to put these on as best I can, but also try to make the images as well. Uh, they're right. pretty easy to document because um, not only these are sold by flag makers, these are sold by stationary shops, but there's also the artwork is provided by the Department of Fine Arts. So where I can, all I have to do is just um, clean up the background image, uh, get rid of the background image, or tra- make it transparent and just put it on the background. So it's pretty easy. Right, gotcha. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I, the link you sent me was for them on Wiki, and I couldn't find them. Couldn't quite find them on CRW flags, which is what it defaults to on mine. But yeah, yeah. When you are like drawing those flags, like, do you? Um, actually, I'll say I'll ask it this way: for older flags that you maybe have like a uh, you have a source for, like you have a historical picture of, but it's in black and white. It's not very clear. It's not very well documented. Like what colors should go where? Like, do you? do you just use the source and just put the source on flags of the world? Or do you make an attempt to like kind of work from that and figure out what it would have looked like and then put like a vector up? So, um, so we'll use all available sources we can. So we, so if it's, if we have documentation, we're able to go and show the entire flag without any kind of guesses or questions, we'll do the image, um, either myself or other people do the images Mm. and we'll upload it. But if it's, an image that we're not sure of or we don't know the definite design of it, we'll definitely make notation saying this is a reconstruction or this is a guess or it says based on this and we'll link the source right then and there. Gotcha. Yeah. I was trying to find like the, um, there's one that, that always sticks out to me. The uh, supposed anyway, like flag of the Benin empire, the one with the guy cutting the other guy's head off with the sword or whatever. Do you know, are you familiar with that one? Yes. I was going to say like that one as uh, it, it cropped up on my radar, like, I don't know, a few months ago when I was going to do one of the, you know, like these are some wacky flags episodes. Um, and I didn't include it because I couldn't like it. Not that, you know, I have to source everything on here as much as <laughs> nearly as much as you do on what you uh, work with. But I didn't include it just because I couldn't like really get a good grip on if it was real or where it was found i didn't know like flags of the world's like stance on that because when i click on benin it just brings up the current one so in cases like that uh sometimes if it's not on the actual like page of benin uh because if it's let's say under a former empire things like that Mm -hmm. um we'll sometimes we'll be either instead of being under let's say the uh the the um, sub page it might be under like a british colonial sub page or right. uh, or something else so in the case of this one if let's say if this flag was not documented before what we'll do is we'll take this flag and go okay this is what the design looks like this is the museum or person or agency that has the design present us the design and here's the information that we're only able to get from this and we can add on research over time right so there's times that we might that somebody might send information about like a flag that's unknown to them and then five years down the road we can say aha here's what it is okay interesting one other question i was going to ask too is because i i feel like i I, I guess I didn't really go through the proper channels or whatever. I, I just kind of like, this was very early on in, in the show anyway, but I was trying to like, I think I had found some flag uh, personally, like I'd found it out in the wild that I could not find anything on Reddit. Couldn't find anything on, you know, one of those rare cases. And I think I like emailed somebody at flags of the world just cause I was like, I was on flags of the world. I was like, I don't know. I just need to find somebody's email address. And I never heard back from them, but. Uh, what is like the proper manner <laughs> because I didn't take it, but like, what's the proper way for like us vax ads? Like if we, if we find something like that, or more likely we have like a correction or an update to something like, what are the proper channels to go through? Um, so there's two ways. There's, there are three ways you can go through. So you can either email Rob himself. Uh, all of our email addresses are listed on the website. Uh, there's some editors that will have their emails listed on all the pages they edit. In my personal case, I have it set up to where 
is when you click my name on the website, it'll take you to a page that says mail me and it has my email address listed there. So you just click on the emails and then you just send the email there. Um, you can either send it to the editor themselves or that specific page. You can send it to Rob or you can join the mailing list. Okay, cool. Yeah, I should probably join the mailing list. That would make sense for something as something to do. I'm trying to like get everything organized too. Like, yeah, now that I'm a year in, I'm trying to get organized, but like, uh, with like the podcast has its own email address and I like, you know, deal with things on that side of things. So I'm going to add it to the mailing list for sure. I was going to ask, like, do you take like any and all flags, just anything that could be described as a flag? Uh, can it go on flags of the world slash CRW? Or are there certain like standards that have to be met? Because I guess I'll give the specific example that I'm thinking of. There's uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I'm from, mm -hmm. uh, there's the East Tennessee Historical Society, where I used to volunteer, is like downtown there. And the last time I was there, they had a flag from the 1982 World's Fair that was there. Um, it's like got this flame that uh, my viewers might recognize for no reason. Don't worry about it. Um, and it had like some colors on the fly, kind of like Tennessee's has the blue, but it had like four colors or something. And I took a picture of it. I think maybe that might've been the one I tried to like submit or at least ask a question about, but uh, I just didn't know if that was like, and I don't, that flag, I don't even know if it was a recreation or an original. So I don't know. I just, I was guys just wondering like what the standards that need to be met or like what uh, documentation needs to be met because I can take a picture of it physically and send it to you and say, Hey, this is a flag that I saw. But is that good enough? So in that specific case, I would say yes. So so the first thing we break it down is we do host flags for off for specific events. So World's Fairs count, Olympics count, um, okay. any kind of unique sporting events. World count, Cup type. Um, yeah. Like I in my editing, I also do a lot of international meetings, so I'll have like just flags of G7 meetings, a lot of international meetings, uh, World's Fair Expo, stuff like that. So as long as, A, it's a significant event, either for that city or for the for the world, mm -hmm. we can include it. Two, we can document it. So in the case it's being held by a museum, then we can go, okay, this is what was held by this museum, and we'll take that information. So... Um, so you took a picture of the flag, you can send it to us saying, hey, this was held by a historical society, a museum, and this was used for this time. So we can we can either show it as either part of the world page or sorry, the world fair page, because there's different things that will happen. Uh, sometimes we'll have like a page dedicated to each event or sometimes mm -hmm. it's done like gallery style to where we'll take whatever year, have some information about it, the image, and it will go down to the next year. Um, there are some flags that we do reject, and that's usually because there's no information about it. There's yeah. uh, there's no pictures of it flying. There's no documentation saying we're trying to get this legislative. Uh, so let's take the new Utah flag, for example. It's like If it was in just someone made a concept art on Reddit and that's it, and maybe done a cloth design, we maybe, maybe not include it, but once mm -hmm. it got involved in a state competition, it was selected by the state and was put up as the the competitor to the now former state flag, that's when we can go document it, seeing that it's going through a legislative process. This is a flag that's being a serious contender to replace mm -hmm. the current state flag. Uh, same thing for the Stennis flag in Mississippi right, because yeah. it was being used on state license plates because it was being used by universities and things along those lines. That's we can go say, OK, let's document this. I assume the same is true for the uh, the Utah, like whatever anniversary one that kind of inspired the current one. Yes, we can. Uh, yes. Yeah, I couldn't see why not. Awesome. Yeah, I, I actually see now on here, I, I do see that the 1982 Knoxville World's Fair flag is on there. So I don't know what I was I, I mess. I must have been doing something else that I was trying to document. But um, it does only have I will kind of just ask you this since I'm here and uh, I have pictures of it. It only has like one kind of uh, JPEG that oh, it's a GIF image. And even the person at the bottom who posted it in 2003 said, hey, if anybody has something better feel free should i bother like 
sending in like photos like would that be useful documentation like alongside this or would that just kind of would it make the page i guess yes so any and all documentation you have so to say hey i've been here i've seen this flag here's pictures of it that's definitely better than uh someone sending us a reddit link saying oh check this out and it just gives us just nothing okay cool that makes sense i'm gonna do that i, I got like homework after this one i got a few things so, like <laughs> first off a few things to remember and find where the you know pictures are but after that um yeah no this is very cool i uh, i assume most of our listeners know how to become like a well becoming a wikipedia editor is a much more like clearly defined path but like is there room for uh more editors at flags of the world like do you guys are you guys interested in taking on more volunteers are you kind of like absolutely we love to take some volunteers we actually do have some openings right now so just so uh so the the day of us recording uh we have Mm. some volunteers that we have some openings for um editing some websites so um so some countries like france belgium luxembourg um andorra uh macedonia eu um are definitely needing some editors um okay i know there's some people that have a lot of different things that they're editing that they'll like to try to offload um uh, either myself or rob is like hey take a few pages here and there just mm-hmm. kind of just make things a little bit easier for us um but yeah we always always will take volunteers not only for editing the website which is just using basic html uh graphic artists will gladly take uh volunteers for graphic artists we'll take volunteers for pretty much most of anything we do on the website cool okay yeah what's like the uh again like i guess what's the proper channel to just contact you and say say that you're interested uh you'll contact rob raveside directly and his email is on the uh the web the page mail me.html on our website Okay, gotcha. And you just email them saying, hey, this is who I am. This is why I like to go edit. And then there's like a, a vetting process, but not like anything intensive. It's just more like, sure. what do you know about flags? What do you know about HTML? What do you know about the topic on hand? Things like that. Right. Yeah, that's that last point was what I was going to ask too. Like, does it help to, you mentioned like, say, France and Belgium. Does it help to come into that knowing quite a bit about France or French and Belgian flags or? Just as. It, it helps, but it's not a requirement. Okay, yeah, that's I guess where I was going with that. Okay, that makes sense. I know, um, yeah, I probably don't know as much as I think I do about French flags. Don't know too much about Belgian ones at all, really. But, but yeah. there's also sometimes too that uh, by taking on like an editing uh, role, there's some months that you don't have to do anything, and a lot of times if there's months that I don't have anything come to my inbox, I'll just go and start doing things on my own or start cleaning up some code or cleaning up images. So there's always something to do, but it's, it's not as intensive. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, Hey, Vex heads, if that sounds like something that might interest you, definitely check that out. sounds like, uh, well, like you said, like Zach said, they're always accepting volunteers. So that'd be cool. If you know a little bit about a country, why not get your name out there too? All right. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, talk with you about the the Arkansas flag as well, which I mm-hmm. mentioned up top. Um, we were talking, there's some peculiarities about it that make it, well, this kind of wraps up or, or goes into the uh, poorly defined stuff. We were talking about it as it relates to colors, but explain how Arkansas is, is you know, a little open-ended. Okay, so... Uh... Back in 2011, while I was still going to school in Russellville um, at Arkansas Tech, um, I was involved in a process to go get some definitions done for the state flag. Um, if I had my way, I would have done specifications about the size of the diamond, the size of the stars, uh, the color shades, the font used on the flag, and what we were able to go and get done um, with the help of legislature, things like that is not only just to find the colors as the official colors of the U.S. flag is official colors of Arkansas, so old glory red, old glory blue, uh, no Pantone shades, um, and also making sure that the ma- that the flags are manufactured for state use is manufactured inside the United States. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that are left open ended, uh, especially when it comes to the wording Arkansas on the flag. There's right. no definition on the font. There's no definition on 
how it's supposed to look like if there's just straight blue letters or has an outline on it. So technically <laughs> you can do, uh, you can type in the word Arkansas in either like a comic sans font, a ransom note font, or my personal favorite windings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's still technically the state flag. Yeah. I, that's the most wild one. Like colors are one thing. Like I, talking to Nasha, talking to you today about like the colors not being properly defined, but the font is something I guess they didn't think they needed to define, but it should be clear by now that they, they could very easily and should probably go in and define that. Yeah, definitely. I uh, Cause I know I had <laughs> I mean, some state officials in the past suggested like a, a sensory font, a block, like a blocky font. Um, I know for the image I use on FOTW, I use like a, a German font, uh, like a di, like a dik font. Um, for the image that we use on FOTW, I'm not sure what I used on uh, Wikipedia. It's been so long, but uh, but still, technically, someone can go and fly a flag with the wingdings in the center of the state flag, and it's perfectly legal. Yeah, and honestly, encouraged if you're. If you're a listener to the show, go go do that. I'm gonna start printing them. I'll get I'll get flags for good to make a that'll be their better Arkansas flag <laughs> for their better state project or better state flag projects. It's just the same thing, but wingdings. I think I yeah I have seen the Arkansas flag in the wild. Uh, well, in Arkansas once it was the first time that I ever crossed the Mississippi River, <laughs> and it was like I was way too old for that to be the case. But we. We were in Memphis for like Memphis in May and we needed like, I don't know, we needed to go to the Walmart across the river for whatever reason. And I got me an Arkansas hat and it had the Arkansas, like not the whole flag, but you know, the, the, the lozenge, diamond. I guess. Yeah. Or uh rhombus, I think. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's like the lozenge or, uh, yeah. or rhombus, but yeah, it's uh, that pattern um, is very popular, especially here where I live, because I live about 25, 30 minutes away from the from Fayetteville, the home of the University of Arkansas campus. Mm -hmm. And you'll see so many patterns with like the, the diamond, with the stars, you have the, the Razorback pig in the center of the stars, or you just have the flag as like the part of the crest, that's part of Front Shirt Parkett, and just, it's very popular. Uh, just Or just anything with a diamond is just very popular. Yeah, as a, as a Tennessee and I can relate, like the TriStar thing is like everywhere around here. Um, not just governmental stuff, but everywhere. Um, yeah, I was looking on the on the flags of the world page for Arkansas, and I see you guys have a state pledge, which is I salute the Arkansas flag with its diamond and stars. We pledge our loyalty to thee. That is uh that's something. We don't have I don't think we have an equivalent with its I know diamond Texas and stars. does. Um I think we had one in North Carolina when I was a kid, but I don't remember. But yeah, it's definitely something they take they take pride in. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I don't know what the Tennessee one would even be. Like, we salute our flag with its circle and stars, I guess. Probably something pretty simple like that. I'm going to, like, I'm probably going to eat my words. Like, there is a Tennessee one, and I just have forgotten it or never knew it. Was there anything else, though, that we uh, really wanted to get into? Um, I would say when it comes to my work with both Wikipedia and Flags of the World, um, it definitely... I would say not only allow me to go outreach to so many different people in our community that are like your legacy uh, members, but also I kind of seen as a gap towards newer members or members from overseas. Like um, I know we didn't touch about this, but, um, but after the, um, the flag conference in uh, DC back in, I think 2011, I was awarded with a fellowship of the of, for just my work with the Air National community um, to try to just build the bridge to gap and also just definitely get more people connected. And there's been a lot of people who have come up to me. They see me as like the legacy, like the new legacy of our, of our mm. field. And I just, it's very just uh, sometimes a little bit overwhelming, but also sometimes very just like, whoa, I can't believe it's my turn now to where, Years ago, I was messaging people like Rob, Nozumi, Zelko, uh, even Whitney Smith, or meeting Whitney Smith with regards to everything going on now. It's like everyone's 
some people are writing me saying, hey, I need help with this, or hey, I want your thoughts about this, and it's just surreal. And and just over time, too, just seeing the kind of resources we have now back versus when we first started doing this is just amazing. And I know, personally, Big Bag Fairy helps, but at the same time, it's just like just yeah. to see how our field has grown in over the decades is just mind-blowing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, like uh, in the Discord, there's like there's some Romanian kid in there that's like 14 that's like writing a book on flags and like has like meetings with like government officials. I mean, like you said, you were in middle school when you were getting started like that. Imagine like being in middle school now with all the tech that we have now. Like you could really go nuts. And he and other you know like young folks like him are, which is awesome to see. Because mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's definitely like a. Uh, changing of the guard i think i said this on the last episode that hasn't been released yet but it's like a uh standing on the shoulders of giants type thing where a lot of the forerunners those that came before have definitely set up the infrastructure and set up like the i don't know it, it seems like they were the wave of like vexillologists and now there's like a much greater wave of vexillographers as a result i don't know it seems like everything's in it uh, very well set up for folks like i think you're like a year or two older than me uh but for folks like us to kind of take the reins when well now really <laughs> yeah so. it's just like with with us doing the show like this and just kind of getting the exposure we are now it's just like it's it's very surreal yeah i mean that's part of like this show has gone through like different iterations even really like uh you know when i first started out i was like i was getting friends to help and everything and we were like it'll be fun like we'll talk about like history of flags uh the design of flags we'll get like a little bit into you know some folklore some like wacky shit like that um we'll talk about all the weird russian bears of course um but then yeah like it started to turn i was like i started to realize i am the only flag show that is an interview format i need to be kind of bringing people together like you um like all these designers like people from like somebody in the discord was suggesting like steeplejacks, like different parts of the flag world kind of bringing them together. And like, I'm just some dude, but I love talking to folks in the, in the Vex community and kind of like, I don't know, and making it happen. It's been awesome talking to you too. Like, uh, I, the stuff you do for flags of the world is, is a lot. I, I sometimes I feel like I do a lot by doing this show. It's, it's not <laughs> comparatively. Cause you're, I imagine like, do you do work for them? Like most days, like maybe if it's just like a little thing here that takes five, 10 minutes. So on an average editing day, it's like, sometimes I might come home from, come home from work and just like wind down by editing. Uh, sometimes if I don't have anything I have to go edit, I'll just go and like find something to where I'm still kind of like active. Um, uh, I personally don't read all the emails of, uh, I still yeah. get them all. Um, but also every month too, I have like a, a digest that gets sent to me of showing what I need, what's been sent. Mm. Um, but so I, I sometimes too, I just do nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> or if it's like, I'll do an image or two and then that's really about it. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a, uh, that's what I like about doing this show too, is I can do it kind of in my, in my spare time, my downtime. I like it so much better than my real job though. <laughs> but anyway. All right. And with that, I think it's time to do our quiz, our usual quiz that we do every week that we never take a break from ever. Um, <laughs> I might've missed a week or two anyway. So uh, Zach, we were talking off air again and Instead of using your favorite flag, we wanted to talk about the Hawaiian flag because the uh, the story of, you know, your first flag that got you into flags is, I find, always a much more interesting story than what somebody's favorite flag is. But for the record, what is your favorite flag? The national flag of Kazakhstan. All right. And so the national flag of Kazakhstan is the one that we're going to do this quiz on today. I think, uh, I think I still have my, I had to clear some media stuff. All right, <laughs> the quiz music does not want to play right now. Let's see if at least this part does. And that part doesn't either. So I'm going to insert those in post, but hey, just feel pressured, okay? Bring it. Do you feel pressure? Okay, good. All right, so question one. Flag of Kazakhstan. 
What are the colors on the flag? It's a, it's a sky blue and golden yellow. Can you be a little more specific on the blue? I I know I know I know there's a uh, a specification for the um, I want to say it's like a Pantone color of like two seven six one something like that. Oh, Lord, I don't know that. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but yeah, what it's I have like here... a very like sky like celeste blue. So it's definitely kind of like it's a little bit darker than Argentina's, but it's definitely kind of like a I would say closer to like Aruba or something like that. Because um, I know there's a probably say maybe closer to like a like a UN blue almost hmm. it's listed as turquoise oh, but turquoise. uh yeah I don't know I, I I I've seen it you know like as someone who works at flags of the world I'm sure you know but I've seen it in various shades <laughs> like in various different uh gifs and jpegs and shit but anyway question number two where did they get those colors from gold and turquoise um from their uh from the nomadic uh turkish tribes in the past that settled in the land yeah uh turquoise like the word itself is turkish or well turkic in origin or the well no the word isn't tur turkic in origin but turquoise and turks share a similar origin you get it um and then the gold came from the it was the color that the like star and the hammer and sickle were on the uh on its ssr flag all right. Question number three. Uh, three, part A. How many rays does the sun have? Not like our sun, but on the Kazakh flag. I think 32. Damn. Yep, 32. Do you know what they are supposed to be shaped like? They're kind of like more like sunflower petals, almost, because it's like, instead of being like actual sun rays, it's kind of like a little curve, like almost like a flower petal. Yeah, noticing that was like a... a that was a really cool moment. Yeah, uh, just grains, basically, uh, because, like, yeah, it's just steps out there with grain that has been sustaining them for centuries and centuries. It's very cool design-wise, too. Um, the ornament on the hoist side is called a, I'm probably butchering this, but a koshkar muiz in Kazakh. What does this mean in English? It's like a, like a, uh, like a symbol of life. I think, I think it is a symbol of life. What I have written here is uh, the horns of the ram is like the direct translation of Kashkar Muiz or whatever. Okay. But yes, it is a symbol of life for them. Uh, question five. What did Kazakhstan, or why rather, did Kazakhstan keep its SSR flag much longer than other ex-Soviet states? Because it was the technical successor of the Soviet Union because it did not leave the Soviet Union. It's just pretty much... Um, it's kind of dissolved on its own, so it adopted the national flag in like 92, 93. Yeah, in 92. It, it was that, and it was the fact that um, pre Russia, pre Soviet, like I think Russia had them before the before it was the USSR, but they had no national flag, so they didn't have like one to like fall back on to go back to like a lot of the other states did. Yeah, I know like Uzbekistan was like that, and Tajikistan was like that. Mm hmm. So yeah, those things in combination just kind of yeah took them most of most of 1992 to get it. Um, the winning design, as originally proposed, had a third color. What color was it? And for a bonus, where? It was a orange, um, the orange uh, ornament that was at the hoist. Yep, yep, orangish red. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, question seven. What is 13 times 13? One hundred and sixty-nine doesn't bode well for you, man. Uh, no. <laughs> in terms of ex-Soviet countries, where does Kazakhstan's flag fall in my personal rankings? I would say probably top five. Could you be more specific? Um, four. Ooh, it's number one, baby. It has to be. Look at it, <laughs> and then look at all the other ones. All right. Well, that was a tough question. I'll give you half credit on that one. It was top five. So do the math on the scores here. Okay. Carry the one. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You did very well. That was a B plus plus. 
I'll take that any day of the week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The B stands for Bravo plus plus. So good job on that one. And man, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming and talking with us today. We'll get into plugs for in just a second, but it's been a lot of fun. I, I did not know much of how any of that worked. Um, so if people want to find you, follow you, like interact with, uh, you know, the work that you do, what's the easiest way, where can they find you and, and do that? Okay, so uh, so honestly, the easiest way to get a hold of me regarding my work, see my work, will be on Facebook. Uh, the name that I have on screen is what I go by. Um, I also do maintain a Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. It's going to be under the username at Splunk ATO. So S P U, no S P L U N K A T O. Yep. That's how I knew you for the longest time. I was like, oh, this Splunkado keeps like, he's doing really well in fresh flags on Instagram. <laughs> it's funny because there's another S name, like another uh, S handle on Instagram that seems to always answer the same ones that you do and not answer the ones that you don't. And so for a while I had y'all mixed up in my head. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, Splunkato, uh, you know, where the at signs are. Uh, also where the at signs are, you can follow us at flagged the number four content. The easiest way to interact with the show is going to be through our link tree, which is just you search link tree flag for content or put a slash at the end. I forget how link trees work. I think it's dot ee at the end. Uh, anyway, yeah, find us there. Interact with us there. We are doing a lot of fun things, moving and shaking. I am sorry that I've been <laughs> a little out of it today. Um, I have recently had surgery, but that's a whole nother story. But that. Zach, thank you so much for coming on and like and just showing us like what it's like to kind of, I don't know, just a day in the life of somebody who's an editor for these various things and and all that. I really appreciate it and helping us uh, know what we can do to do the same. Hey, that's my pleasure. I thank you for having me on today. Yeah, man, you'll have to come back sometime when I'm less scatterbrained and uh, maybe with a couple others and we'll do like a roundtable type thing. That could be fun. Absolutely. I'll be down for that. All right, man. Well, I will see you in the discord. I might need your help with like one more thing though, while sure. I've got you here, I misplaced my notes on how to close this show. So if you've got anything that could help, uh, I'm all ears. Alrighty. Well, I just was well, just want to say, cause I hope that the, whoever's listening, your day is just like the Argentina flag outside. See less blue. Mm. Anything else? No bueno. No bueno. I love it. I love it. I'm going to go fly that one today. Anyway, thanks, Zach. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks in general. This episode has been Flagged for Content. Ooh, Jesus Christ, Andrew. All right. <laughs> Flagged for Content is a Flags for Good podcast. Go to flagsforgood.com for more info.